Most people like something humorous. And there is a time for lightness. There's a time for things to be, as we say, funny or humorous. There are times to laugh at things. But when you consider worldly people and sometimes even religious people, some of those religious people even believing in the God of the Bible and Christ, many of the things that the Bible has to say that's very serious should be making us sober-minded and to think in a critical manner as we apply the truths of God's Word to our lives, get laughed at. The atheists and so forth like to laugh at things pertaining to the existence of God, of the deity of Christ, the infallibility and inspiration of the scriptures. But they're in a sad shape when they do. And we in the church need to know that there are some things that are no lasting matter. It's interesting that James would write to Christians in James chapter 4 and verse 9, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And of course, James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing to these Christians, is contrasting two different attitudes that people have toward God. One of careless indifference and joy, and the other of sobriety and humility, because they understand that the conclusion of the whole matter, as the writer of Ecclesiastes said, is to fear God and keep His commandments. And such passages as Jesus' statement in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Many passages are like that in the Scriptures that teach us that in this life, in the flesh, in this world, we're to take things very seriously when it comes to God and how God would have us live. So James teaches us the attitude that we're to have before God when it comes to an honest scriptural evaluation of our lives. We're not to take these things lightly. When the Lord makes it clear that we need to take them very soberly, that this means me when I read the Bible, not you as such, Thus, we should take it personally. The Bible is a book for all of us because it's God's will. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, verse 25. But when I read it, when I study it, my mind is attuned to it like this. This is for me. I am to be abiding by what I read. It was addressed to me. Since it was addressed to all mankind and I'm one of mankind, then it's addressed to me. It's meant for me to study and think about myself in the light of what it teaches. So in this study today, I would like for us, in a very simple way, to study five of examples and notice what every one of them, every one of them have in common. Go back with me to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Let us go to the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. Genesis 18, 9 through 15. And we read, Moses giving us this account. And they said unto him, speaking to Abraham, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. 
And Sarah heard it in the tent door. I've often wondered why she was there. She wasn't eavesdropping. The tent door, which was behind him. And then the scripture, Moses tells us by inspiration, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased with Sarah after the manner of women. Look at verse 12. Therefore, in other words, anybody knew this, she did. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then watch what he comes back and says, At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Well, now Sarah's hearing this too, and then notice, then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not. So she was afraid. He said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. You know, nothing in the Bible is there just to take up space or give us some sort of little interesting happening. Uh, we're reading a part of the unfolding of the scheme of redemption and the development of a messianic family that would finally turn into the messianic nation from whence Christ and the tribe of Judah would come and all the things we read about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would take place. But I'm zeroing in on Sarah at this point. I think as a human being we can't be too hard on Sarah. She is a skeptic here at what was said about her. I think it's somewhat understandable just being a human being. The scripture says that Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in age, and she was past childbearing, verse 11 of 18. Now, sometimes we don't mention things about Abraham in this case, in this particular case. Because earlier when Abraham was first told, first told the promise of Sarah having a son, that he fell on his face and laughed. Genesis seven seventeen. Now, I think it's reasonable to assume that Sarah could have heard of the promise from Abraham after that he heard it. But when we get to chapter 18 of Genesis, we see two different reactions as far as Abraham and Sarah are concerned. Sarah laughed to herself, Genesis eighteen twelve. But the second time around, Abraham did not laugh. Initially, seemingly, Abraham was shocked at the news that he would have a son at his age, past childbearing. But now at this time, it's not the case with him. The focus comes on Sarah. She still reacted with laughter, which is a way of showing disbelief in the word of God, in this case a promise, that she, though past childbearing age, naturally speaking, would have a son. And this seems to be the reason why, when confronted about laughing, that she denied it. Uh, I think she was ashamed of her reaction, Genesis eighteen fifteen. Remember, these are not two people who just don't care about God. But they are a people who did not have a lot of things in the way of revelation of God. In fact, most things that we have in the New Testament. They didn't even have what uh, we call the Jews having as far as the Old Testament was concerned. They're in the patriarchal age. And God speaks to man through the heads of the families, the fathers of the patriarchs, and gives direction to them. Fundamentally, patriarchal age was basically moral law. Religiously, they built altars and made sacrifices and worshiped God. But this is early on in the revelation of how God would save man. 
And it's important that Abraham and Sarah truly trust God in all things. Some people seem to think that, well, this was a miraculous thing that she had a child. There's nothing in the scriptures that says this was miraculous. Not a thing. And thus, if the normal law of procreation had to take place, and it did, that Abraham and Sarah had to both believe that they could have a child. So it's a serious matter. It's not a light matter. It's nothing to be laughed at. Nothing to be laughed at. So there's one time that two very good people, as far as good from God's perspective, uh, laughed, and Sarah in particular, at something that should have been taken very seriously, and you can see the response. Make it very clear, no, you did laugh. And then a repeat, I will come and you will have a son. That settled the matter seemingly, and they took it for what it was worth. But then we come down to this passage of Scripture. Again, in the book of Genesis, chapter 19, verses 12 through 14. 19, 12 through 14. This is after Lot and his family have got into Sodom. God is determined to destroy Sodom for the intense wickedness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. The angels have been sent, and now they're there with Lot. Now, Lot's girls have married men of Sodom. And the angels have the appearance of men. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Pretty serious matter because he says, for we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out. See, Lot takes it seriously. Remember, Peter tells us the conduct of those wicked people vex Lot's righteous soul from day to day. So Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said up, Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But now here's a, the, the point I'm wanting to make that Moses records here about them. Here's the attitude of the sons-in-law. But he, Lot, seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Genesis 19, 12 through 14. Have you ever tried to study with somebody that's totally wedded to this world and not open to anything from the Bible or for that matter anything of religion? They are the ones that will mock and make light of and laugh and ignore or make some sort of crude remark or whatever. And here we are as the church commissioned by our Lord to preach the gospel to every creature and all that's to go on till the end of time because the gospel is God's power to save us from sin. Romans 1.16, of which Paul said, I am not ashamed. But you know, there were a lot of people who were ashamed in the first century because to be crucified by the Roman Empire was to suffer the lowliest of deaths. A Roman citizen would not be crucified. So it was reserved for people who were really bad folks. And it was considered to be a very terrible thing to know that one family member had suffered crucifixion. But nevertheless, that was in the teaching of God as to how the Savior would save man, Romans, or rather 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, when you consider what actually happened here at Lot's dwelling and remembering what Lot had seen, remembering what they had witnessed in their relationship with Lot's daughters, and if he was a righteous man, the Bible says he was, 
They knew very well how Lot felt about daily conduct in that wicked place. But they were one of them. Part of it. It shows you that they had little respect for what Lot was telling them. They mocked him. You know, they mocked Christ hanging on the cross. If he be the Son of God, let him come down to the cross. And they wanted to stay. Let's just stay here and see what happens. When he said, Eliah, Eliah, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They misunderstood him. They thought he was calling Eli. Let's, let's, stay, let's, let's sit here and watch and see if Eli comes or Elijah. See if he does. Well, they weren't willing to side with Lot. They thought he was joking, you might say. Well, all we know is that he wasn't joking. But one has to go with that reality in mind. And today as the church strives to be what the Bible says it ought to be and to still reach out there to people with the gospel, I think you can expect more of this. They may not say it to your face, but they may say it otherwise. And certainly religious things are mocked, made light of. People laugh at them. Coming on down to Second Chronicles chapter 30, I'm going to look at about three verses. Verses 1, 5, and 10. Second Chronicles 30, 1, 5, and 10. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah. Hezekiah was a good king, loved God. Seeks to do is the law Moses taught the Jews. It hadn't been being done, so he wants it done. He wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover under the Lord God of Israel. Then down to verse 5. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even unto Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel in Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it is written. Then in verse 10. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. Now look at the latter part here. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Again, Second Chronicles 30, 1, 5, 10. These were not pagans. These were God's chosen people whom God had given the law and given the land of Canaan. But at this time period, long years thereafter, they don't care about God. The Passover was highly significant to the Jews because it reminded them of what? Well, it reminded them of bondage in Egypt and that God had punished in the last plague all the firstborn of Egypt if they did not have the blood of the lamb as God had commanded put over the lintel and the doorposts of their houses. Of course, the Jews did, the Israelites. But everything was killed. We forget sometimes this is not only just of people but animals. The firstborn of animals died. But God passed over the Israelites who were faithful to him in doing as he told them about the blood, what they were to be doing at that time. So this was very important. What does it say about them forgetting God? Well, they even forgot what delivered them, what made them a nation. Forgot that they were in bondage. Forgot about all the wanderings. And if they forgot about that, what else had they put out of their mind? And how much had they embraced the wickedness of that world? So in the neglect of the Israelites, they were thumbing their nose at God and his commandments. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 5, they had not celebrated in great numbers as it was prescribed. The authority of God and the law of Moses for the Jews didn't make them any difference. And that was a part of God's law, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 3. And as any part of the law, it should have been observed. Now here is a king who's doing what he can as king 
to make sure the children of Israel are living like the law says. And messengers from Hezekiah declared that this was to be done so they could enjoy the favor of God. Second Chronicles 30 and verse number 9. And the law of Moses instructed them to observe the Passover. There was a promise of God's blessings if they did. But notice, the majority rejected the decree. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even into Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 10. Second Chronicles 30 verse 11 does tell us that some of them humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. I'm always thankful for those people who are willing to see their sins, admit them, and change their lives to repent of them. But the majority disregarded the call and they didn't observe the Passover as it was reinstituted. It was some kind of joke. They mocked it. They made light of it. The people who should have respected it the most mocked it. If you come down to another one, another example from the Old Testament, and here's a good time to remind us, as Paul said in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we'll look at two verses, verses 15 and 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now look at the next verse. But they mocked the messengers of God. And despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. I would suggest a good reading of Stephen's sermon in the book of Acts will remind you, as Stephen did, how the people of God treated the prophets overall as they were sent to them by God. Remember, God chose the Jewish people out of all people as a civil nation on the earth. They had a particular job to do. They never did really understand what they were there for, Deuteronomy 7, 6. And Jerusalem was his city, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 5. But that didn't mean that the people could not go into captivity, that is, be punished for their unrepentant sins, and that that city could be destroyed. They seem to think that since we're Jews descended from Abraham through Jacob, and that we have the law and the temples here in our city, whether we kept the law or not, God's going to be with us and he'll put up about anything happening to us. Yet the prophets came to them and said, you must repent. Read Isaiah and Jeremiah's examples of that. Ezekiel, any, many of the other prophets. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 15, Scripture reads, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, Rising up betimes means over and over again and sending. And why did he do it? He's not. He's long-suffering, as Peter said, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He still is. So he says here, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Yet they had already rejected God. Being moreover all the chief of the priest and the people transgress very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 14. Well, there's an end to all those things. So he would not listen while they practiced their sins. 
He did not bless them while they practiced their sins. He did not choose to favor them because they rejected him. They chose to make fun of the prophets who warned them from God. And you look through the Old Testament, you'll see that kind of thing happening all the time. So there's an example. It's not a laughing matter. Then we come to the New Testament. We come to the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 41 through 42. And then skip down to 49 through 53. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age. And she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Now we come down to verse 49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into his house, or into the house, he suffered, which means he allowed no man to go in, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not. She's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. That understood Christ who he really was, realized what he was up to. It made no difference whether she was dead or asleep, literally. What is that to Christ? He created all things. And as he would say at the tomb of Lazarus before he raised him from the dead, I am the resurrection of the life. And thus she, he raised her from the dead. But notice, they took his words lightly. We think if we were around Christ as he was on the earth, a man, we wouldn't act that way, would we? I think as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how the people dealt with him, yes, even those who would serve him greatly at times would have laughed at him. Because what you see before you is not somebody walking about or floating about two feet off the floor and glowing like the sun. You see somebody that the Old Testament said was not somebody that was desired when you looked at him. He was just a Jew and not too handsome at that. And yet he would astound people in his teaching because he taught them as one that had authority. And thus he says these things matter-of-factly. But here in the midst of their great loss, they laughed him to scorn. Why? Luke says, knowing she was dead. Why did they ever approach, approach him in the first place? If they didn't think he'd handle the matter. Well, that's the way we are a lot of times. God tells us matter of factly in his word exactly what's what. We read it intellectually, we understand it. But like the Jews of old in the wilderness wandering, as the inspired writer of the Hebrews said, they heard all that, but it didn't help them any because it wasn't mixed with belief. Yes, I read the facts. I can read it and understand the meaning of the words, these signs of ideas. I understand the idea. What kind of confidence do I have in it? What kind of trust does that create in me toward Jesus Christ and his will? So it's not a matter of just believing in God and believing in Christ. It's a matter of believing in his system of salvation that he will do what he said and the way he said it and for the reason he said it. These didn't have that, though they were seeking after his help. That's what's always interesting. They went to Jesus. Jairus did. I got one daughter. She's nine to death. And he falls down at the feet of Jesus. He thinks... He can 
heal her. But the same power that heals beyond natural means is the same power that raises from the dead. So the condition of this man's daughter may have seemed hopeless. It says she was dying, Luke 8, 42. But John tells us that the things that prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, that he did them to prove that very thing. Miracles, John 20, 30, 31. So many other cases we read of the miracles that were done. So it's an amazing thing how Jesus is approached by Jairus for his only daughter who's sick and he knows she's dying. Expects him to come and heal her, but when the report comes, she's dead. Don't trouble the master anymore. He can't do anything in the world about it now. But if he could make her well as a sick person, he could raise her from the dead. Notice he's simply saying to them when he comes into the house, takes Peter, uh, uh, Peter and, and uh, John and the parents and so on, stop weeping. And notice, as far as I'm concerned, he who created all things, stop weeping. She's not dead, but she's asleep. Well, he knew her spirit was in the Hadean world. She's just as much alive in the sense of her spirit existing and thinking and knowing as she was when she's in that body. And what is it to Christ to put her right back in the body? Nothing. So there were also our other times when we see Jesus spoke of death and he spoke of it as a temporary thing, John 5, 28 through 29 and various other places. We would do well to form the view of our lives as Jesus formed them. Because he's not wrong. And we should look at our lives on earth for the reason God put us in the fleshly body in this material world. One reason. Get ready for eternity. You do not know when death's coming or when the Lord comes back. Over and over again, but watch, he says. How do we watch? We know and do the truth daily. That's how we watch. We don't have to be concerned. We get run over today by a truck. We don't have to get concerned if the Lord comes back the next whenever. We're ready. And we're ready by being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much, watch this, for as much as you know, know that your labor is not in vain, pointless or worthless in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Those words are as true as the ones Jesus said to Lazarus when he raised him from the dead. Lazarus, come forth. Someday, our Lord, when he returns, as it were, will call all of us who are dead back to life. So notice that everything that we looked at today as an example of any of the promises of God, any of the statements of God, any of the teachings of God, everything we looked at today that was laughed at actually came to pass. What does that tell you about men and their attitude and their perspective? And interestingly, in each of these examples, the promise or the warning or, instructed, or instruction that was mocked or flippantly received or ridiculed, all of that, it came to pass. God said Sarah's going to have a son, did she? Yes, she did. Genesis 21, 1 through 3. Lot was telling what the angel said. Sodom is going to be destroyed. Was it? Yes, Genesis 19, 23 through 25. Regardless of how much they laughed or mocked. The Passover was reinstituted, 2 Chronicles 30, 13 through 15, though the people of God at that time who had not been practicing it laughed at it. 
And Jerusalem was overthrown because of the sins of the people, Second Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. And that was told it would happen. Did it happen? Yes, it happened. And Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, no matter even if her own parents laughed at the idea that Jesus said she only sleeps, Luke 8, 54 through 55. Does this cause us to reinforce and, yes, reinvestigate our minds toward the reading of the Bible and how we read it? what we understand. These things seem to be unbelievable to those before they happened, but they occurred. They happened. They took place just as God said they would. Now, when you look at these further, they have things in common that I want to mention as we close. All of these examples we've selected from the scriptures were of people who in their given instances lacked faith in God and in his word. Now, if you had asked them, most of them, do you believe in God? They'd say, oh, yeah. But you see how it goes beyond that? What God said, they didn't at that time. In each of these examples, they did not believe what God revealed to them. Whether it embraced a promise or it was warning them about something or you better obey this command. So I want to close with what I said earlier concerning the benefit of these examples to us who have the New Testament of Christ to guide us, lead us in service to Him and in worshiping Him. Whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. When God says something's going to happen, it will happen. When God tells us that the end of the world is coming, it's going to end. When God tells us that there's a judgment of all people coming at the resurrection of the dead, some raised to eternal glory and some to eternal sorrow, that's going to happen. When we're taught by Paul that we must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, that is going to happen. People laugh at it. People laugh at the final bowl of the wicked. Think of how people in their swear words use hell. It's used in every way under the sun in a flippant manner, as well as heaven for that matter, or as well as the Lord and taking his name in vain. And so many things as far as the Bible are concerned. But what I've given you today as well as all others like them are for our benefit. God means what he says and he says what he means and he keeps his promises. We should learn from the sins and the shortcomings of those we consider who at the time of these happenings didn't have the faith in God and his word they should have had. So we above all people have all of this to strengthen us in accepting the warnings and the promises that God has given us. That is right where we started. What's the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. We say, well, I don't want to have time to do this, that, and the other. If the whole duty of man is fear God and keep his commandments, you may want to set other things aside in order to keep his commandments. Not only may you want to do so, if you go to heaven, you must. There's no dodging it. There's no getting around it. And you can't laugh it away. If you're not a child of God this morning, we want to give you opportunity to become one. To believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Romans 10, 17, John 8, 24. To repent of your sins as commanded, Acts 17 and 30. To confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And to complete your obedience to the gospel of Christ and becoming a Christian by being baptized into Christ, immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Romans 6, 3 and 4. 17 and 18. 1 Peter 3, 21. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. 
there is no other plan God's given among men to save us. Take any part of the steps of the plan of salvation out, and it's not the plan of salvation. It will not save. And it makes me no difference how many preachers rise up and laugh at it. It used to be said we have a rain like we had in the last few days. I'd hear people exclaim it. I did hear part of it this week, and I still use that myself. Boy, this is good weather for puddle ducks. But they used to say, boy, this is good weather for puddle ducks and Campbellites. Because we emphasize the teaching of the scriptures concerning exactly when God remitted sins. Being baptized as believers who repent of their sins and confess their faith in Christ for unto, in order to, the given end of what? The forgiveness of sins. Yet the Bible says it. But we're laughed to scorn because we teach the plain simplicity of the Word of God concerning exactly how you become a Christian and when. And we don't move off of it if we're faithful to God. As a child of God, are you living steadfast to the truth? That which God teaches in the New Testament about worshiping God acceptably and living daily as he teaches. If not, God's second law of pardon is that you repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Now we customarily offer this invitation. Because it's been a time after we studied the Bible, our minds should be centered on the truth and on spiritual matters, and we should be asking Am I ready to leave this building and meet my maker? So we give people an opportunity and sing an invitation song, inviting them to obey the gospel while these things are sharply on your mind. As we stand and sing, please come to Jesus as you need.